In terms of revenues, we do hope to hang on to the current projected GPA because in combination with some use of fund balance, we experience an increase in non-property tax revenues on the top of the page. As a result, bottom of the page, we are allowed to offset expenses and reduce the request for local resources, as you can see in this change in tax request number here. There's been some interest in general, in general fund surplus, undesignated general fund surplus, or the monies that are still available after all the fiscal year obligations have been met. Has, um, uh, there's been interest there, and, and it has actually, as you can see, come almost full circle from this first projection to the um, FY13 number. FY13 ended with more than a $1 million balance. This was not a mistake. This was the result of good management, spending that was controlled in anticipation of a possible curtailment, and some spending variances that were actually favorable. Generally, a fund balance of approximately 3% is considered to be ideal for schools, though you can see we've not been sitting with that for these last several years. In this particular budget and in an, effect, in a, uh, an effort to minimize the adverse impact, adverse tax impact, we've built in, and what's calculated into this budget, is the use of $500,000 um, of surplus to carry forward as revenue to be used in this, 20, in this upcoming 2015 budget year. This is a nice new little budget summary. Um, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is are four numbers. Um, we would be looking at at the top here, it's 9.9%, .9%, total general fund operating expenditure as compared to last year at this time when we were looking at this 10.57 number. The impact uh, that you're looking at on this line in terms of positive um, adjustments in our revenues um, basically creates this less than 8.5% uh, property tax revenue request as compared to what we were presenting in our first um, reading last year of more than 16%. For those of you like me who are more intrigued with visual pictures rather than uh, tables and a bunch of text, here is the pie chart of how expenditures in this proposed budget break out using the state mandated voter categories. And as probably all of you know, these are the categories that are found on the explanatory sheet that accompanies the ballot that is used in the, ballot, the budget validation vote. And it's important to know that this year, that vote is scheduled for May 13th. Yikes. So to me, a picture is absolutely worth more than a thousand words. Uh, this line graph in particular provides a historical view of per pupil spending for district here in the greater Portland area. With, um, and those are districts with, with whom we share some comparable demographics. I don't know if you can see the legend on the side here. Um, and even if you can't, well, if you can, you know what the districts are. But if you, even if you can see them, it's likely that you're not going to figure out which dot goes where. Uh, the two that I would draw attention to are these. The green line here is the state average. This is Scarborough. I know that um, Monique will talk quite a bit about some of our data and what that data tells us, um, but there are clearly some mis 
perceptions that exist about Scarborough's very, very low per pupil cost and the learning results that we are getting for our investment. Unfortunately, those that believe that we are getting an extraordinary bang for the buck are not entirely correct. I'm not going to steal Monique's thunder. I'll let her share that data with you. The interesting piece here for me is not that it's below the state average, but how far below it is from the state average. Both operationally and organizationally, we've continued a very aggressive stance in both combating increasing costs and in improving the quality and efficiency of all of the aspects of our organization, not just the educational components. I've captured some of our bigger initiatives operationally and then also organizationally. A big undertaking this year has been the creation of a long-term facilities team and the hiring of an expert to guide us in the development of a long-term facilities plan. This plan will significantly increase our ability to push to higher levels of energy efficiency and get stronger returns on the investments that we make in our facilities. Just below that deals with benefits. We've had contractual changes, um, benefits restructuring, and actually some possible benefit initiatives that should better enable the school organization to put the brakes on these rising health costs so we've not sit idly on the sidelines. Organizationally in our schools and in information technology, we are considering or making organizational shifts to maximize the impact of our instructional and IT resources to make sure that we are delivering higher quality services to students and to staff. And our school partnerships with business and the greater community are continuing to grow. The 2015 budget for the first reading contains both a capital improvement and school nutrition budget. This is uh, simply a summary of those budget sections. Both of these elements sit outside of the general school fund, and they are, but they, it's important to know that they are relatively similar to the budgets from our current operating year. And so now the work continues as we all work closely with the school board, finance committee, and the larger school board. And together, this group here, as a strategic leadership team, the school board and the leadership council, we still have work to do. This includes some further vetting of the investments and program restorations, some further vetting and understanding of the budget adjustments, some further vetting and understanding of what's sitting in CIP, and certainly as we go along, updating as we uh, begin to finalize some of those external cost estimates that are still keeping us in flux. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, I, I, one of the things that I wanted to make note of, and it's actually on this meeting uh, date slide, is that the opportunity certainly to walk through all of the details of this budget that's being presented tonight will happen in public workshop on Saturday, April 5th, starting at 8.30 in the morning. And we certainly invite interested members of the community and certainly would like to send a special invitation to our town councilors to join us in that, in that workshop. And then uh, with these dates, please ensure that these dates are on your calendar. We look forward to productive conversations to include listening, problem solving, strategic thinking, and ultimately good and effective leadership that will deliver a budget that will, in Jefferson's words, provide Scarborough's children a good education. And I want to, just before closing, recognize and thank this group of very dedicated, very passionate, and very forward-thinking educators that I am so fortunate to be able to say 
is our leadership council. They really are the best. They're sitting behind some of you, but you can turn, turn around and take a peek at them. They're pretty special. And thank you all for your attention. Any questions? Any uh, clarifying questions? Chris. Um, just, a, just a few um, on the expenditure drivers. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, it's, it's page five of our handout. Thank you. I'm not sure what slide number it is. Um, the line item for Anthem MEA changes. Correct. Um, what percentage increase does that reflect? And I'm sure Kate knows. Kate knows. Yeah. Shall I check? It's, right now, the, the estimate is at 9.5%, and I think I'm close enough to be heard, um, which is they've told us the cap on what the MEA Benefits Trust will be looking for for an increase. We're hoping that it will come in lower than that, but it's pretty impossible to uh, guess. Uh, but we will have some real answers. They've said by the end of March or the beginning of April, so we're very close to knowing that. Thank you. Um, on the uh, page seven of our handouts, on the revenue side, we're looking at change in tax requests. Um, is that a number that we've generated, or was that in conjunction with the town council's finance group, or however they they come up with a typically their number as well? That is simply the uh, the net dollar amount that we're requesting, it doesn't uh, actually calculate the tax rate for you because that's a function of the entire municipal budget. Okay. But we'll have that as, as uh, the town puts together the full budget. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, last question on the uh, page 10. CIP school nutrition side of things, the safety facilities and maintenance number. Um, are, are a large portion of those recommendations from the Joint Safety Committee? They were, uh, they were re reviewed by the Health Safety Security Advisory Team and endorsed by them. Okay. Thank you. So is, are those all across the district in various capacities in different buildings? I'm sorry? The ones, the safety facilities and maintenance piece? Yeah. So are, are they, do they impact the entire district? Yes. yes. Okay. There is a detailed list in your packet. In your packet. So you'll oh. be able to see how that breaks out a little more. Okay. Thanks. Um, one other thing, George, that I don't think you mentioned is that we will be posting all of the more detailed documents to the website probably in the next week so that everybody can see the details. Kelly? Does that, uh, I don't know if it's in our packet or if it's on those documents you're talking about, but. The per pupil comparison, could we get that in a list? You can get it. We can give it to you in a chart. Okay. Yeah. In color. In color, because it's hard to see when it's black and white from here. Yeah, okay. it's, um, and again, the purpose of this roll-up tonight is to just let you know what's in there. And okay. we have any of the detail that you need behind any of this, you likely have. But, for example, a color chart or a color uh, or more a table that has the ac actual numbers. Right. If you look at it, it's dizzying. The, the table is dizzying. That, that's a little overwhelming as well. I think what we wanted to really highlight was Scarborough's relative position to the state and to the other districts, basically the other districts uh, that we compare ourselves to, with a couple of new ones added in um, at the request of some folks who were interested of, in some specific districts. So just curious, dollar-wise, um, how much is it for us to meet the state average? Because like someone said, that chart kind of gives you a little bit of a off. I can't, it's like $11,500 is the state average maybe? Or mm -hmm. a little more? Yeah. yeah. I haven't so done that calculation this year. But it, it, would, it, would, just it, curious would, it would be that. Sure. It would be, yes. At the high school, if you increase per pupil by $4,000, that's about $4 million in high school. Mm -hmm. We could get that number for you, Christine. I think that we had we had used that in the presentation before. How much would it cost for us? I mean, how much more would we be spending if we actually hit the state average? And how much would we be spending if we hit the average of what our comparable districts spend, which is going to move us, it's going to jettison us up into the middle of that chart there. Um, and those numbers were, they were fairly significant. It's um, 
it's in the millions of dollars, and it was upwards of $4 million, I think, to meet our colleagues and in excess of, uh, uh, what was it, six? Okay, so we're really big. Yeah. Really big. Yeah. Um, but we can get those numbers. Um, we thought the visual was powerful, and we, oh, can, and we can look at more details. Um, and like I said, the chart has actually every single one of those districts and every single one of those years uh, plotted on the chart, on the uh, table. Okay. Other clarifying questions that you might have? Mm -hmm. No other questions? <coughs> Thank you very much. Oh, at this point, I believe. Uh, the report out on students' progress is money. Do you want me to first of all? Well, motion to don't, uh, Dr. Ensel, mm -hmm. before we do that, don't I need? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'd be looking at, before we go on to the student uh, report out, or student progress report out, I'd be looking for a motion from the board. Uh, move to accept the first reading of the budget for FY. 15 as presented. Second. Okay. Any questions, comments? Again, <laughs> first reading. Yeah. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, the frustration level is, it continues to be there um, as the curtailment and the cost shifting from the state as a whole gets piled on to the municipalities. Um, it's it's, um, it's it's a challenge for us to maintain our fiduciary responsibilities when the state is not meeting theirs. Um, so when we see dramatic increases uh, on the revenue side or dramatic losses on the revenue side, as a, as a community and as a district, it's very difficult for us to bridge those gaps. So it's not a reflection of our operational performance. It's really a function of our loss of revenue from the state. So I think it's very important to understand that. Um, and really, again, if the more pressure we can put on Augusta to meet the requirements that they've accepted legally, uh, I think the better off we'll be. Um, one other comment to the general surplus fund. Um, that, that, I think, sometimes can look like an easy target. Um, we've used the general surplus fund in the past to offset some of those expenditure, lo some of those revenue losses. And we've depleted that fund to the point where we really need to get back to a, a strong financial footing. So, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've in essence been paying forward, hoping that the, the financial recovery comes faster than it has. Um, but at some point, we can't completely deplete that fund. So it may look like we're adding more revenue and, and bigger increases into the uh, into the general um, uh, the general fund surplus but that's actual good financial policy. We need to maintain that. And that's not extra money that we're putting in the bank for another future rainy day. That's basically paying back what we've taken out so far. Anything else? Seeing nothing, nothing else. All in favor of approval of the first reading of the FY 2015 school budget as presented by Dr. Antwerp. Thank you very much. So moved. All right, we now will move into the workshop session. So we have a report out on student progress. I'll turn that over to Monique Culbertson. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm here tonight um, to share with you that, um, <coughs> that progress, that student progress, and really take a look at what the data tells us. Although the data is limited to certain subject areas, uh, it, there is good news and there is some concerning news. Uh, as the improvement cycle continues, I mean, we clearly heard via the community dialogues that we've had in the past, uh, we have some goals and we're busy working towards those. Uh, we're busy strengthening the basics, uh, the literacy, the writing, and the math, but also emphasizing the college and career readiness for all, the application of those basics. We have, as you've heard in previous meetings, been working at shifting towards that student-centered learning. We're also involved in rebuilding foreign languages as budgets have supported incremental additions into the foreign language, but we're also maximizing our resources by redesigning how we deliver foreign languages to help ensure that our students achieve at the highest levels of proficiency, especially in the high school level. Oh, yes, thank you so much. 
We've also been involved in building that quality assurance capacity from everything to developing our instructional coaches to taking a look at the teacher evaluation piece to looking at our curriculum and building our curriculum to make clear what those standards are that we're working towards for all students. We've been busy energizing the professional learning. The PLTs, as you've heard, Dr. Entwistle will speak of the um, excitement that teachers uh, have over being involved in improving their instructional practices and on and on. But what does the data tell us? Well, we're going to be taking a look at some key areas, early literacy, reading, writing, mathematics. We're also going to look at uh, graduation data and AP participation data as well. So we have, uh, for reading, writing, and mathematics, we have the NECAP assessment, the New England Common Assessment Program. That's the state mandata mandated test. Those will be ending this year because we're going to be shifting to the Common Core assessments beginning next year. We have Ready Step data, which is a precursor to the PSAT. We also have the PSAT data to share with you today and the SAT data. The SAT data comes to us from the senior class and AP participation data. To begin with, we're going to start with the early literacy data. As you saw in a previous presentation, uh, a report on our Jumpstart program. That's where we identify our, our pre-K students who may be in need of some early literacy intervention. This was a summer program funded in part through the Sebago Alliance and in part through local dollars. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner there, sort of the pre-screening data, one of the uh, assessments we use is called lowercase id. Oh, I don't know if I dare. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> no directions on here. Right here, this was before the students entered. That would be last March at this point. And then the chart below was at the after jump start. So you can clearly see the increase in the numbers of lowercase letters that these students knew after this summer program. But over on your right, one year later, you can see that those gains have continued to increase. <clears throat> this is uh, half the student population, but the other data that we've taken a look at also confirms looks quite similar to this. So you can see, here's another assessment, and you can see similar growth. Uh, this assessment is the sound ID. Do our students know the sounds associated with those letters? Again, an important pre-literacy screening. You can see where our students consistently have grown. And <clears throat> as you can see, the investments have resulted in some very encouraging results, and we'll continue tracking these students over time. This year, you'll notice as you look into the details and as we uh, chat with you on April 5th, we're requesting some additional funds to expand this program. We're able to service about 24, 25 students last year and would like to double that for next year. What you have before you in this chart is NECAP reading assessment. The NECAP, that state mandated assessment, is given in the fall, in October. So it really refre reflects, this is the grade three results, really ref reflects the learning that took place in grade two. So what you have within this chart our scores come back in four proficiency levels. So the dark gray at the top represents the percentage of our students who exceed the standard on the test for critical reading. The lighter gray is the percentage of students who meet the standard on these tests. The dark purple is the percentage of students who are partially proficient. And the light, that lavender color, are the percentage of students who do not meet proficiency on the assessment. So what we look for over time in order to inform our programming and our curriculum review cycle is what are the trends here? Is it flat? Is it erratic? Is there a trend upward, downward here? And we also like to look at not just those students who are not meeting or partially meeting, but also we want to make sure that we are growing students into those more advanced categories as well. You'll also note that in reading we have not made significant investments in the area of reading at K-5. <clears throat> We've had uh, the benefit of, um, we were able to hang on to our academic support staff, and that's why there are relatively low numbers of students who do not meet in those categories. Those folks work very hard at that. Here's the data. Reflects a similar erratic trend in reading. Uh, this reflects grade four learning. <clears throat> 
here's the data for grade six. <clears throat> and although in 2013 we did make an investment in the uh, middle school ELA curriculum, we have not yet seen those gains. It's still er too early to tell. And those curriculum materials are tightly aligned with the Common Core, which the NECAP doesn't assess as well as the Smarter Balance will assess moving forward. <clears throat> So we're hoping through those smarter balance assessments, we'll see an emerging trend. Those curriculum materials have also been redesigned. This is Ready Step data for critical reading. Ready Step is more like a PSAT data, a test. Uh, I call it bridge data. I like to have data that is similar across phases so that teachers can come together and analyze the data as students move across those phases. Uh, Ms. Hathorne and Mr. Creech and I have been involved in strengthening those transitions and working with data is a part of that picture. We only have two years of data here, so we really can't make a whole lot of conclusions around trends. One of the things we do look for is in the local data, which is in blue as compared to the national, how far above the national are we? Are, is our increase, are the increases that you might see, are we coming closer to the national or are we moving apart from the national trend? So we look at data in a number of different ways. <clears throat> the PSAT for grade 10 over time, you can certainly see where that 2008, 09, 10 and then the drop in 2010. <clears throat> you can see where the national is uh, moving in an upward trend, and yet our performance has been erratic over time. We had at one point, the PSAT is given in the fall, uh, which really reflects grade 10 performance. And if you recall, um, those of you who have, may have had high school students some years ago, there was a freshman team at the high school. And I'm not advocating for freshman teams, but what those teachers were able to do was to have common planning time and they had the same group of kids. So they often worked in planning for students and planning instruction and sharing reading strategies across that team of teachers. We were unable to sustain that team approach at the high school because of reductions in staff, increased enrollment, and the schedule was also um, a hindrance in terms of being able to find that time for staff to come together to plan for students. You'll see the PSAT in grade 11. Again, the national trend is increasing and our performance is trending towards the average. <clears throat> in the SAT, um, again, even though the national performance has taken a dip, our performance has certainly mirrored that, maybe to an extreme. In terms of writing, writing is assessed in the district. Uh, again, state mandated assessment in grade five and in grade eight, and then again in the Ready Step and the PSAT SAT assessments. We have, even though we have provided um, support in the area of reading, we've, we've been able to, um, we've not been able to provide the same levels of support for writing over time. Here, there's no clear trend, and likewise at the middle school. Uh, we're hoping this will change as we begin to um, realize the results in the recent investments <clears throat> and the ready step data. As we take a look at the ready step data, we're seeing a potential trend there that worries us. Teachers are working very hard. I want folks to realize that teachers are very hard. They're using that PLT time. We have groups of teachers working on writing, doing research. Uh, expanding um, their knowledge about effective strategies, trying those out in the classrooms, uh, and reflecting on that. <clears throat> the PSAT in grade 10 for writing, if you take a look at that national trend and compare it to ours locally, again, it's a bit more encouraging the last three years. <clears throat> and then grade 11, uh, again, there seems to be a trend towards the national average, uh, but again, erratic. We're not seeing that positive trend that we see when we uh, do a comprehensive curriculum review and infuse professional development and curriculum materials there. SAT in writing is even more concerning. The high school staff, the department, uh, realized this, and last year they began piloting a writing 
not a writing program, a means of looking at writing and having our common writing prompt, and they leveraged an online resource. We were able to allocate funds towards that um, endeavor where the teachers are calibrating each other uh, to make sure that they have common expectations for writing. They're receiving that data. And last spring I was involved in discussions around that. They decided to continue that, to do a fall and a spring prompt so they could take a look at their data. They could look at the breakout information about what the strengths are and the weaknesses are in their classes and then share strategies. If a particular teacher has particular strengths in teaching one aspect of writing, they share those strategies with the other teachers in the department. I just finished working with the um, high school, the English department just last week where we took a look at other data sets in and around writing so that they could move forward with their continued planning in this area of professional development. The middle school is also looking at this process as well for next year. So in summary, uh, at the K-5 level where we've been involved in a comprehensive curriculum review both for reading and for writing, the group identified writing as a primary focus area. They're more concerned about our performance in writing. So we're gonna, we've recommended and we're moving forward with a two-year implementation uh, with significant professional development uh, and comprehensive curriculum materials in the area of writing K-5. Uh, revisions in the middle school ELA curriculum uh, have occurred and we'll be investing in those revisions. But also the reorganization for staff to focus on content area uh, is very important. When they took a look at high-performing schools, they found that within high-performing schools, the middle school teachers had one area of concentration, not multiple areas of concentration. And so another reason for that shift. So the professional development in writing and reading will continue, and the high school will continue to focus on writing and analyzing the data that they find and sharing those writing strategies. In mathematics, you well may see a very different view of the data. And this is an area where we have heavily invested. Uh, I was taking a look at some very old data. This is one advantage to uh, having been around a while. Back in uh, 2000 in math, we were pretty consistently at the elementary grade 60% partially meeting or not meeting in mathematics back then. 60%. We did a comprehensive curriculum review, provided professional development, uh, and we flipped that around in five years, we were at about 40%. So we completely flipped that around. We were static for a while, and now what we're doing here, as you see from 2009 on up, we just recently implemented uh, the math and focus curriculum. So 2012, we can begin to see those, that encouraging trend where we have more students in that gray area versus that purple area. I would like to highlight this, again, this graph represents grade two learning. Our K-2 schools have done a wonderful job over the past couple of years at implementing the curriculum, uh, and we see that in their progress. Uh, as a matter of fact, a corner school, which is a Title I school, has just been recognized as a high progress reward school, uh, <clears throat> which is, means that they're among the highest 15% of the Title I schools with the greatest level of progress over the past three years. This is in part due to the curriculum piece, but in part it's due to, again, another investment we made in a children's progress assessment which provides teachers formative data in the area of mathematics but also in reading that's used by the teachers to measure student progress and adjust their activities that go along with that that they use with their students. So eight corners about three years ago was at 48% partially or not meeting in the area of mathematics. They've shifted that within three years to 22%. So over a quarter of the student population has moved up into that meeting or exceeding category. But they don't deserve all the spotlight. Both Blue Point and Pleasant Hill have also made significant gains. Blue Point has moved from 27% to 23%. So a 4% difference there, and Pleasant Hill from 22% to 17%. So we are moving students up into those um, meets and exceeds categories there. At grade five, you can begin to see from 2012 to 2013 an increase in the number of students moving into that meets and exceeds category as well. At the middle school, the middle school implemented 
uh, the Impact Math program prior to 2009, and over time they made gains, significant gains, uh, but over time the performance flattened out, if you look at the pur that purple um, and gray lines there, and so they've just begun this past year, so you are not going to see um, any ch shift in the data um, on these charts, but they've just begun implementing the uh, middle school version of the Math and Focus program along with the high school professional development that took place at the high school this summer uh, was significant in that middle school and high school teachers worked together. The Ready Step data in mathematics, again, only two years of data here. Uh, so we'll be taking a look very closely uh, next year to look for some trends and some more um, detail in that data. The PSAT in grade 10 over time. Again, you notice that downward trend. Math department was quite concerned about that. They were one of the first departments to dive into the draft of the Common Core Standards to really take a look at what they needed to do to start making some shifts. They came to me wanting to get some new curriculum materials and professional development, but at that point in time, given what the budget would allow, we were able to move forward with uh, the K-5 and then the middle school and just this past year, we were able to move forward with the high school pieces. PSAT, grade 11 math, again, trending towards the national average. And the SAT in mathematics at certain points in time, and you can align these right up to those budget numbers, you can see where some of our students were performing below the national average. So hopefully that trend will turn around as we continue with professional development with staff. So in summary, as you could see from the graph, uh, there's a bit of an upward trend uh, in the area of K-5 mathematics. Uh, those investments um, have been maximized and we continue to maximize those. We have instructional coaches helping to support teachers in the classroom. Uh, 6 through 12, we're in the first year of that implementation, but the professional development isn't a one-shot deal. We're planning professional development this summer as well. The reorganization, again, the reorganization at the middle school to allow for that content specialization, um, we're confident is going to help us out. Also, part of that reorganization will allow those math teachers to work together. <clears throat> Advanced placement data. Advanced placement is an assessment that provides our students with the opportunity to demonstrate to work at a college level. Uh, but then to take a test, the advanced placement test, in early May uh, to see if they can score a 345. If they score a 345, they well may be in line to receive, um, um, move into a more advanced coursework at the college level. You'll notice if you look at the numbers of students in 2010, 146. 2011, the number of st our students who accessed AP courses actually went down. 2012, significant increase. From 2012 to 2013, only about nine students. What you'll also notice is the enrollment in those courses is, for example, in 2013, 372, which basically means our students are accessing AP courses, uh, but they're accessing multiple courses. We want more students to access AP classes. What we're finding is the students who access AP classes are just taking more of them. Uh, and they're challenged to do that because our schedule doesn't allow them to take more AP classes for the reasons that you've heard um, at previous meetings. Uh, the other piece is we haven't been able to offer more AP classes because of our restrictions or limitations in the number of staff we have. And so we haven't added new um, AP courses in the last five years. The only new one we added was last year, which was Calculus BC. And prior to that, because we had students who qualified, the teacher did it on an independent ba study basis uh, on their own time. And I just I mention that because that's an illustration of how hard our teachers are working in order to provide opportunities for our students. Uh, we have AP potential data, which tells us that in Scarborough, uh, we could be serving more students in more rigorous courses. But again, um, Limited resources have us a bit stymied. We are making progress. For example, in foreign languages, we've been adding um, staff at the middle school. We still don't have um, elementary foreign language. We're looking to add, the committee is making a recommendation to have uh, foreign languages be a uh, requirement for graduation. 
That's also a recommendation from the state. That will require uh, additional staff as well. Uh, this year we're looking to bring back AP Psychology. We used to have it. We had to um, stop offering it because we didn't have enough social studies teachers, but we're looking at bringing that back. We're looking at um, potentially some AP courses being able to replace some core courses in order to offer those opportunities to students. So my message is we're maximizing our resources. We're really looking at how we can more efficiently use those resources. We're trying to make our decisions student-centered. Uh, and as you can see from graduation rates, uh, we have relatively low um, dropout numbers. Uh, but certainly, uh, we are not going to be content until it is zero and we have 100% of our students graduating from Scarborough High School. Uh, but the question we wrestle with is, what are our graduates doing and how well prepared, how ready were they? Uh, and that's another resources issue to go out and get that information and find out what our graduates are saying after their first year, after their third year, after their fifth year, um, after their tenth year. <clears throat> so in summary, looking at this student learning data uh, gives us some feedback, uh, but it's delayed. It takes a year or so before we get these results back, so we don't have immediate uh, student performance data, uh, but we do have, can look at trends over time. The testing protocol is going to be, um, is redesigned. Uh, we've got the smarter balanced assessments coming down the pike soon, and as you may have heard, the SAT has been redesigned uh, in another, um, in 2000, spring of 2016. That will look different as well. Our professional learning teams have really uh, skyrockets the data focus. We have teachers doing action research, looking for best practices, trying those practices out in the classroom, and then looking to see what the impact is on student performance. The notion that low investment uh, is producing high performance is misguided. Uh, I will say that we take great pride in um, squeezing every dollar we do receive. I like to share that our science kits materials have a shelf life of about eight years and we're running up on about 18 years on those. And you certainly heard about um, the situation with textbooks uh, and technology. But as you can see, there is a point at which uh, there's a diminishing return. Uh, and you can see that in the data, in the plateaus, the gaps, the regressions, and the erratic trends. Uh, indicators of project and new positive trajectories, the community dialogue um, absolutely hit the right targets in terms of world-class teaching and learning so that all students, to ensure that all students thrive in all spheres. Uh, there isn't a staff member who disagrees with that. They're working very hard at realizing that. So the improvement targets were certainly um, well chosen, uh, and the staff are committed to working very hard. Uh, and where we have invested money, I'd like to ensure the community uh, that we're seeing encouraging results. Thank you. Thank Questions? You. Okay. Yes, any other questions? Thanks. Um, page three of our handout, the early jump start. Mm -hmm. um, are we looking at expanding the criteria for for testing success beyond the recognition of letters and the sounding of letters? Are we looking at a, any kind of number component or anything like that, or are we just going to focus on these two criteria? Um, before they're able to read, gain meaning from text, this is pretty much um, the data that tells us that they're well on their way to reading. Once they are beginning to read, we have informal reading inventories that we use, Rigby reading assessments, and part of our um, uh, curriculum review and implementation in terms of reading, we'll be shifting over to different reading inventories so that we can continue to pract uh, track their reading progress. Um, and, and it, just in general, and I don't know how difficult it would be to do this, this is more of a general question for the, for the administration, how difficult would it be to correlate funding data with performance data? Because I know it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. If we see a cut, let's say, in FY10, we don't see that impact on performance until maybe FY11 or FY12. It would be, it would be very helpful, I think, to present 
some kind of mutual graph or some kind of analysis correlating, here's the cut, here's the impact. It's not immediate. It's not, mm -hmm. might not necessarily be that year. We can certainly look at that, and, and what resonates with me is foreign languages. Because as we eliminated positions and programming at the elementary and also at the middle school, that uh, ripple effect we're now seeing at the high school because students are not prepared to access advanced coursework in foreign language. Uh, so we actually have students who are at the high school who in the past may have entered in a level two or even a level three uh, foreign language course, and now they're at level one. So we're going to see a fall in our AP, the more advanced coursework, our AP numbers, just in terms of enrollment, uh, as well as performance. So that is something, that's the one that comes right up to mind, and that's something we can work on, see what we can provide. Okay. Um, the, the ready step data and some of the other data where we're compared on a national level. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, because we're looking at funding on the cohort level, is it possible to get local data to see, and it's nice to know where we are nationally, but I don't know if we can access data from the cohort group to say, yes, we're at a four, let's say, for ready step reading grade eight, um, but the surrounding communities are maybe a, a 4.5 or something like that. Is there a way to access that data and do a comparison? Uh, it, not for ready step because we contract, it isn't public data and there aren't, um, our, all of our cohort schools don't use the ready step data, but certainly for the main high school assessment, which is based on the SAT, we can gather that information. Okay. Um, and kind of the last question, you touched on a little bit about when the SAT is, the, the format's changing? Yes. Um, I understand part of that might be the removal of the writing portion, is that correct? The writing portion will become optional. Okay. Are we going to, because the demographic is showing a decrease in performance, are we going to substitute another demographic to track our progress in that, or are we going to, how are we going to assess whether we're improving in that, in that area or not? We haven't gotten that far in our conversations. Um, I think the fact that the high school is doing a fall and spring writing prompt where they're getting some feedback that, will, that is a lot closer to the instruction than even the SAT writing piece will be is one part of that. The other piece is that the state used to fund the SAT uh, for our students. Um, what I understand from the state is that they, if they have money left over, they will help fund the SAT, but right, they are committed now to the Smarter Balanced Assessment for the 11th graders. I have included in our budget, I got a, a cost proposal from the College Board on what it would cost to continue to provide the SAT to our students because one, I think it's an important assessment for the college piece, but also in terms of our tracking our performance, I believe it's important. So we will need to wait and see what those costs are with the new SAT, and we may decide to um, not make it optional for our students, but to provide that. So I have a question to follow up, to follow, follow up to Chris's. If you're, the state is cutting their funding to that, effective like immediately with the Last this this year, this year is covered. This year is covered, but yes, next year they would. They used to fund the right. ninth grade, excuse me, the tenth grade PSAT. I believe it was a tenth grade PSAT, and they also funded um, the ninth grade Ready Step for it. So they're going to cut. Yes, both. both of those are gone. Um, but I've included that was part of that the reallocation of our funding. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at eliminating some of our assessments and pieces in, in some of the lines in the curriculum area to help fund those assessments so we can continue to, to track our students' progress. I'd be interested in knowing if, if they have money. I mean, how, what's their if? I mean, <laughs> a lot of other places that money ends up going, right? Right. They won't fund they it. They won't fund it. So basically they're just telling us you're on your own. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I saw Jackie and I saw Jane, so I don't... I have multiple questions uh, that uh, affect both what the curriculum is doing and the budget is doing. And one of them is that I, I had asked for this data when we talked about the technology, and that was about the cost of our last full textbook purchase versus what it would cost to do the same thing with technology. That's number one. 
Number two, what is the age of the text that we text that we are currently using, and are they outdated? And if we needed to replace those, what would be that cost versus the cost of a technology replacement? Thirdly, uh, I'm very concerned that it have been, as you know, for at least three years now, about the effect of the testing on students who are not going to go to college, but are going to go to work, are going to go to the military, and all of this testing is required of them. And I don't believe that we're getting a true reading, number one, because I don't think they care terribly about the results of the testing. But how do we, what are we doing to see if those folks have had a successful high school experience? One of the, um, uh, let me address a couple of those pieces. Um, one of the significant shifts um, that the Common Core is, um, proposing is that all students need to be college and career ready. The notion of college only being four-year liberal arts is um, archaic. All students, even if they leave us and go into the world of work, still need to be involved in training programs, still need to be able to write effectively, still need to be able to read critically. And so the shifts in those standards, and quite frankly, the shift in the SAT test is to better reflect that. And that's where the um, focus is coming from, is from the world of work saying, we need students who can write effectively. Not a, um, a narrative, but we need people who can respond and support their positions with evidence. We need students to write succinctly. Uh, grammatically correct, um, and so that is fused into the Common Core standards, and that's what colleges are also looking for. So this notion that students are going to complete their education at high school is one that we need to help people shift the understanding around, is that we want to ensure that students are post-secondary ready, and that education is going to continue. Even if students go off to college, in, within four years and graduate with a degree, they will move on to a career or further, and even within a career, they're going to continue their education over time. And our language is getting in the way on that. Uh, when people say college, when I say college now, I'm not thinking four-year college liberal arts. I'm thinking any post-secondary educational experience. And that's what the Common Core is putting forward. Uh, so. The testing is changing to better reflect that, so it's not just that which is taught in a four-year college experience. Uh, in terms of our textbook replacements, um, it's very difficult to quantify that. The range of copyright dates range anywhere from 1996, they're older than some of our students, um, all the way up to most recently we um, did a replacement uh, for foreign language uh, for uh, French last year, and the math books are, are, have been recently at 612. So we have a range of copyright dates, uh, so we would need to do a, a pretty extensive inventory. Uh, the tech, in comparison with the technology, the textbook versus the technology, there will always be a need for print resources. We certainly, those print resources will be minimized. Inevitably, textbooks will not exist because of what technology has to offer. So eventually, our students will need to have the technology because the textbooks won't be available. And even now, they're offering subscriptions when we purchase the print textbook. Wendy, yep. your rhetoric is wonderful, and I love to listen to you, and you are right on. But if this Board of Education is going to try and convince this community that we need one-to-one -one, uh, applications and one-to-one -one computers for our high school students, we have to be able to justify that cost. Yes. And unless we can tell the public that it's going to cost this if we buy a full adoption of textbooks as opposed to the technology 
and uh, a basis yep. of textbooks. We have nothing to talk about except the cost of the computers. And, and we've built that, we've begun that business case and developing that business case and looking at those numbers. Um, and in our planning and our thinking to move towards a one-to-one -to -one initiative, we've been having conversations and we're working towards building that capacity. So when we move forward with a proposal, you will have that information. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's less the cost advantage right now in terms of being able to support that. But again, given our um, limited resources in IT, in terms of staffing, in terms of our tech integrators, um, it would be very difficult at this point in time to come forward with such a proposal uh, <clears throat> to be able to support it. Our infrastructure isn't yet in place to be able to support it. It's not just as simple as providing one-to-one -one devices. There's staffing and infrastructure that needs to go along with that. So we're building that business case and we'll be presenting it to you uh, in the future. Um, and there'll be more detail on that piece of it at the April 5th workshop. But it's not included in this budget that I presented. Okay. There's not a one-to-one -one proposal. Yeah. If, with regards to textbooks, if we're using textbooks, copyrighted, not copyrighted, 1996. Okay. Is that an appropriate text for current for the current environment of learning for our students, number one. And number two, if it is not, what would the cost of replacement be? Parents and, and community members need to know that. Yep. This is data that we can use to support our needs. And, and I'm not trying to make work for anybody. I'm trying to accumulate a basis for, for supporting our budget and teaching our children in the real world. And, you know, I, I get very passionate about this, as you well know, and I have fought budget after budget after budget over the years. And I think if we're using text that old, uh, I would have to know what the subject is, certainly, because some textbooks, you know, doesn't matter when Harry Potter was written, it's still a good book, you know, and appropriate probably for 40 years to come. But that's not what I'm talking about either. And, and I appreciate your passion, and you'll see um, on April 5th, you'll be able to get into the details. Leadership Council has worked hard at uh, putting forward a budget that prioritizes and does replace textbooks on a cycle. We're trying to get back on that cycle. Thank you. <clears throat> Jane had a question. Yes, uh, I see from the performance data, I do not see NWEA, which we have been doing for many years, and that rich uh, score for the kids uh, in terms of reading and math. I have found that very helpful to so see what the kids have been learning, kind of progress every mm -hmm. year. And I do not see that in our the, in the, the background, why it's gone away. And, uh, um, it hasn't gone away. I didn't include it in this presentation because I was worried I was going to choke you with too much data. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the trends that we've seen over time, we do similar analysis and we look at it from cohort group. We follow a group of students um, and track their progress and we also look at grade level performance and it mirrors the data you've seen here tonight. And, uh, from that, I feel like we have been doing a lot of uh, curriculum mm -hmm. and, uh, improvement and I see if just like a uh, kids who have been doing that curriculum like in the middle school for a year, how much they have been, you know, in terms of the performance, how much they have learned, we show up as the map data, you know, from the NWA. Does that help us say, you know, what we need to do in terms of the curriculum? Do you look at those data to, to, to uh, when you think about what, you know, you need to improve? Yes, we use that data to look at, at to inform our programming as well. It's more useful to help for teachers to help them see strengths and weaknesses in the sub-skills. Uh, it provides that level of data for instruction as well. Um, I often hear teachers say, you know, this standardized test, the score doesn't come to them in time for them to really do anything about it. 
is there, I don't know how do you say this data year old. Uh, when do we get this data back? Can we do a more, um, can we provide to the teacher, you know, as a feedback as sooner than, you know, make them useful to the teachers? With the ready set PSAT yeah, data, yeah, this with this data, as soon as I get it back, and I immediately call the building principals so we can sit down and take a look at the data, and it's shared with the classroom teachers. So they are kind of getting back in like in a few weeks? It depends on the, the data. The ready step data comes back. Uh, usually, it takes. It's not a few weeks. It's a couple months. Yeah, it's real. It's it's horribly slow, and that's what makes the NWEA data and any online assessment data much more powerful. It's much more. It's immediate feedback. Uh, the smarter balanced assessments, uh, which will be the new state mandated assessments, those are designed to be taken online. So I'm hopeful that those results will come back to us much more quickly than these um, paper pencil tests do. Thank you. And I got another question in terms of the high school uh, AP participation. Um, do you see, a, you know, I know that you talk about certain students that like taking multiple classes. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we see that like some students not be able to progress enough to take the, you know, the AP classes because they use a requirement. You know, you have to pass certain classes. Um, is there anything we are doing to make them ready for AP classes as soon as it's possible? One of the pieces that we're working on, all the instructional coaches are working on now, is taking the curriculum, and specifically at the high school, and taking their um, curriculum, making clear what those standards are. We're entering it into our curriculum database. And then we're going to go through a review process to make sure that the course sequences provide students with the opportunities necessary, the stepping stones in learning, in order to access those high-level courses. Do you think you know, in the schedule of four years, they will be able to, you know, all these steps don't get to most students to get to the AP classes? Uh, yes. We are also going to be looking at multiple tracks. For example, some high-performing schools are able to enter students we, and this is one another reason why our high school is working quite closely with our middle school, so that we can move that those stepping stones back into middle school to see, okay, if students have certain skills, met certain standards, they may be, ac be able to access those advanced courses sooner in their careers. So, um, and for the for the AP classes, mm -hmm. um, the participation do these classes for you know the Every classes, I mean, are these crowded? It, are they, um, it depends on the course. Um, some courses are more accessible and more popular than others. And others, for example, a, um, a calculus BC, where you may have taken AB, that may be smaller than um, the, a, uh, the AB course. Um, so it depends on the course. It varies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, currently, I know that there has been in the past some access at the middle school for incoming freshmen in math, say, to take algebra, or I'm sorry, I'm trying to trace, trace back here. Geometry. Geometry is a freshman, that's how it works. Okay. Geometry is a freshman. So are you hopeful that more students will be able to do that because of the... Actually, okay. as a result of the impact math curriculum, the curriculum before the math in focus, uh, the high school seen a significant drop in the numbers of students taking Algebra 1 and a significant increase in students accessing geometry because they were getting, uh, the students were getting the majority of the Algebra 1 content in that eighth grade year. In the math in focus, we're targeting those pieces and we've adjusted the curriculum to be able to continue to do that. We're in a bit of a transition year this year, so it may not be as, as consistent as it was in the past. But Kathy Terrell at the middle school is working quite closely with uh, Drew Sullivan at the high school to make sure that that is a seamless transition and that trend continues. Okay. Uh, sorry, Minnie, just to follow up to we were talking about the state assessments. Um, if the state, and I think I've heard you correctly, the state is going to shift performance measurement away from SAT and into Smarter Balance Assessment? Smarter Balance 11th grade assessment. That's the most recent communication that I have from the state. Okay. If they do that, we're still going to rely on SAT data? Will we, will, or are we, going to, are we also going to transition away from SAT into this Smarter Balance Assessment for evaluation? 
that decision hasn't been made. Okay. Uh, not seeing the, um, not knowing where the state was going to go, not having seen the smarter balanced assessment or what those results look like yet, I felt that it was prudent to include in the budget recommendations the funding to continue to do what we've been doing until we get a better sense of what is coming down the pike, and then that would be a, um, a decision we would make as a, a, as a leadership council. And just a, a follow-up to that, have you heard anything from the state in terms of requiring that smarter balance assessment? Uh, is it going to be tied to state funding or the quote-unquote grading system or things like that? So if we, uh, is it an extra assessment now we have to perform in addition to everything else, or is it going to replace something? It replaces the state mandated assessment. So at grades three through eight, what I refer to as NECAP, mm -hmm. uh, will now be the smarter balanced assessments. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the SAT will be replaced with the smarter balanced 11th grade assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Appreciate your support. items on the agenda. Seeing none, the will of the board this evening. I, I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? All in favor of adjourning? Six plus two. Motion. <laughs>